Chapter Five of Mystery of a Hansom Cab by Fergus Hume, read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Mrs. Hableton unbosoms herself. Mrs. Hableton was a lady with a grievance, as anybody who happened to become acquainted with her soon found out. It is Beaconsfield who says in one of his novels that no one is so interesting as when he is talking about himself, and judging Mrs. Hableton by this statement, she was an extremely fascinating individual as she never by any chance talked upon any other subject. What was the threat of a Russian invasion to her, so long as she had her special grievance? Once let that be removed, and she would have time to attend to such minor details as affected the colony. Mrs. Hableton's particular grievance was want of money. Not by any means an uncommon one, you might remind her, but she snappishly would tell you that she knowed that, but some people weren't like other people. In time one came to learn what she meant by this. She had come to the colonies in the early days, days when the making of money in appreciable quantity was an easier matter than it is now. Owing to a bad husband, she had failed to save any. The late Mr. Hableton, for he had long since departed this life, had been addicted to alcohol, and at those times when he should have been earning, he was usually to be found in a drinking shanty spending his wife's earnings in shouting for himself and his friends. The constant drinking and the hot Victorian climate soon carried him off, and when Mrs. Hableton had seen him safely underground in the Melbourne cemetery, she returned home to survey her position, and see how it could be bettered. She gathered together a little money from the wreck of her fortune, and, land being cheap, purchased a small section at St. Kilda, and built a house on it. She supported herself by going out charring, taking in sewing, and acting as a sick nurse. So, among this multiplicity of occupations, she managed to exist fairly well and in truth it was somewhat hard upon Mrs. Hableton. For at the time when she should have been resting and reaping the fruit of her early industry, she was obliged to toil more assiduously than ever. It was little consolation to her that she was but a type of many women, who, hard-working and thrifty themselves, are married to men who are nothing but an incubus to their wives and to their families. Small wonder, then, that Mrs. Hableton should condense all her knowledge of the male sex into the one bitter aphorism, Men is brutes. Possum Villa was an unpretentious-looking place, with one bow-shaped window and a narrow veranda in front. It was surrounded by a small garden in which there were a few sparse flowers, the especial delight of Mrs. Hableton. It was her way to tie an old handkerchief round her head, and go out into the garden and dig and water her beloved flowers until, from sheer desperation at the overwhelming odds, they gave up all attempt to grow. She was engaged in this favoured occupation about a week after her lodger had gone. She wondered where he was. "'Lyin' drunk in a public-house, I'll be bound,' she said, viciously pulling up a weed. "'A spendin' his rent, and a spillin' his inside with the beer. Ah, men is brutes, drat em. Just as she said this, a shadow fell across the garden, and on looking up she saw a man leaning over the fence staring at her. "'Get out!' she said, sharply, rising from her knees and shaking her trowel at the intruder. "'I don't want no apples to-day, and I don't care how cheap you sells em. Mrs. Hableton evidently laboured under the delusion that the man was a hawker, but seeing no handcart with him, she changed her mind. "'You're taking a plan of the house to rob it, are you?' she said. "'Well, you needn't, cause there ain't nothing to rob. The silver spoons as belonged to my father's mother having gone down my husband's throat long ago, and I ain't had money to buy more. I'm a lone person as put on by brutes like you, and I'll thank you to leave the fence I bought with my own hard earned money alone, and get out.' Mrs. Hableton stopped short for want of breath, and stood shaking her trowel, and gasping like a fish out of water. "'My dear lady,' said the man at the fence mildly, "'are you—' "'No, I ain't,' retorted Mrs. Hableton fiercely. "'I ain't neither a member of the house nor a school-teacher to answer your questions. I'm a woman as pays my rates and taxes, and don't gossip nor read your rubbish in newspapers, nor care for the rushings. No how, so get out.' "'Don't read the papers,' repeated the man in a satisfied tone. Ah, that accounts for it. Mrs. Hableton stared suspiciously at the intruder. He was a burly-looking man, with a jovial red face, clean-shaven, and his sharp, shrewd-looking gray eyes twinkled like two stars. He was well-dressed in a suit of light clothes, and wore a stiffly starched white waistcoat, with a massive gold chain stretched across it. Altogether he gave Mrs. Hableton, finally, the impression of being a well-to-do tradesman, and she mentally wondered what he wanted. "'What do you want?' she asked abruptly. "'Does Mr. Oliver White live here?' asked the stranger. "'He do, and he don't,' answered Mrs. Hableton, epigrammatically. 
I ain't seen him for over a week, and I suppose he's gone on a drink like the rest of em, but I've put something in the paper as I'll pull him up pretty sharp, and let him know I ain't a carpet to be trod on, and if you're a friend of him, you can tell him from me he's a brute, and it ain't no more but what I have expected of him, he being a male. The stranger waited placidly during the outburst, and Mrs. Hableton, having stopped for want of breath, he interposed quietly, "'Can I speak to you for a few moments?' "'And who's a-stoppin' of you?' said Mrs. Hableton defiantly. "'Go on with you. Not as I expects the truth from my mail, but go on.' "'Well, really,' said the other, looking up the cloudless blue sky, and wiping his face with a gaudy red silk pocket-handkerchief, "'it is rather hot, you know, and—' Mrs. Hableton did not give him time to finish, but walking to the gate, opened it with a jerk. "'Use your legs and walk in,' she said, and the stranger having done so, she led the way into the house, and into a small, neat sitting-room, which seemed to overflow with antimacassars, wool-mats, and wax-flowers. There were also a row of emu eggs on the mantelpiece, a cutlass on the wall, and a grimy line of hard-looking little books, set in a stiff row on a shelf, presumably for ornament, for their appearance in no way tempted one to read them. The furniture was of horsehair, and everything was hard and shiny, so when the stranger sat down on the slippery-looking armchair that Mrs. Hableton pushed toward him, he could not help thinking it had been stuffed with stones, it felt so cold and hard. The lady herself sat opposite to him in another hard chair, and having taken the handkerchief off her head, folded it carefully, laid it on her lap, and then looked straight at her unexpected visitor. "'Now, then,' she said, letting her mouth fly open so rapidly that it gave one the impression that it was moved by strings like a marionette, "'Who are you? What are you? And what do you want?' The stranger put his red silk handkerchief into his hat placed it on the table, and answered deliberately, "'My name is Gorby. I am a detective. I want Mr. Oliver White.' "'He ain't here,' said Mrs. Hableton, thinking that White had got into trouble, and was in danger of arrest. "'I know that,' answered Mr. Gorby. "'Then where is he?' Mr. Gorby answered abruptly, and watched the effect of his words. "'He is dead.' Mrs. Hableton grew pale, and pushed back her chair. "'No!' she cried. "'He never killed him, did he?' "'Who never killed him?' queried Mr. Gorby, sharply. Mrs. Hableton evidently knew more than she intended to say, for, recovering herself with a violent effort, she answered evasively, "'He never killed himself.' Mr. Gorby looked at her keenly, and she returned his gaze with a defiant stare. "'Clever,' muttered the detective to himself, "'knows something more than she chooses to tell, but I'll get it out of her.' He paused for a moment, and then went on smoothly. "'Oh, no, he did not commit suicide. What makes you think so?' Mrs. Hableton did not answer, but, rising from her seat, went over to a hard and shiny-looking sideboard, from whence she took a bottle of brandy and a small wine-glass. Half filling the glass, she drank it off, and returned to her seat. "'I don't take much of that stuff,' she said, eyeing the detective's eyes fixed curiously on you. "'But you have given me such a turn that I must take something to steady my nerves. What do you want me to do?' "'Tell me all you know,' said Mr. Gorby, keeping his eyes fixed on her face. "'Where was Mr. White killed?' she asked. "'He was murdered in a handsome cab on the St. Kilda Road.' "'In the open street?' she asked, in a startled tone. "'Yes, in the open street.' "'Ah!' she drew a long breath, and closed her lips firmly. Mr. Gorby said nothing. He saw that she was deliberating whether or not to speak, and a word from him might seal her lips, so, like a wise man, he kept silent. He obtained his reward sooner than he had expected. "'Mr. Gorby,' she said at length, I've had a hard struggle all my life, which it came along of a bad husband, who was a brute and a drunkard, so God knows I ain't got much inducement to think well of the lot of you. But murder! She shivered slightly, though the room was quite warm. I didn't think of that. In connection with whom? Mr. White, of course, she answered hurriedly. And who else? I don't know. Then there is nobody else? Well, I don't know. I'm not sure. The detective was puzzled. "'What do you mean?' he asked. "'I will tell you all I know,' said Mrs. Hableton, "'and if he's innocent, God will help him.' "'If who is innocent?' "'I'll tell you everything from the start,' said Mrs. Hableton, "'and you can judge for yourself.' Mr. Gorby assented, and she began. "'It's only two months ago since I decided to take in lodgers. But Sharon's hard work, and so-and's trying for the eyes, so being a lone woman, having been badly treated by a brute, who is now dead, which I was always a good wife to him, I thought lodgers had helped me a little, so I put a notice in the paper, and Mr. Oliver White took the rooms two months ago. What was he like? 
not very tall, dark face, no whiskers nor moustache, and quite the gentleman. Anything peculiar about him? Mrs. Hableton thought for a moment. Well, she said at length, he had a mole on his left temple, but it was covered with his hair, and few people would have seen it. The very man, said Gorby to himself, I'm on the right path. Mr. White said he had just come from England, went on the woman. Which, thought Gorby, accounts for the corpse not being recognized by friends. He took the rooms, and said he'd stay with me for six months, and paid a week's rent in advance, and he always paid up regular, like a respectable man, though I don't believe in him myself. He said he'd lots of friends, and used to go out every night. Who were his friends? That I can't tell you, for he were very close, and when he went out of doors I never knowed where he went, which is just like him, for they says they're going to work, and you finds em in the beer-shop. Mr. White told me he was a-going to marry an heiress, he was. Ah, interjected Mr. Gorby, sapiently. He had only one friend as I ever saw, a Mr. Moreland, who come to with him, and was always with him brother-like. "'What is this Mr. Moreland like?' "'Good-looking enough,' said Mrs. Abelton sourly. "'But his habits weren't as good as his face. "'Ansom is as Ansom does, is what I says.' "'I wonder if he knows anything about this affair,' thought Gorby to himself. "'Where is Mr. Moreland to be found?' he asked. "'Not knowing, can't tell,' retorted the landlady. "'He used to be irregular, but I ain't seen him for over a week.' "'Strange, very,' said Gorby, shaking his head. I should like to see this Mr. Moreland. I suppose it's probable he'll call again. Abbott, being second nature, I suppose he will, answered the woman. He might call at any time, mostly having called at night. Ah, then I'll come down this evening on chance of seeing him, replied the detective. Coincidences happen in real life as well as novels, and the gentleman in question may turn up in the nick of time. Now, what else about Mr. White? About two weeks ago, or three, I'm not certain which, a gentleman called to see Mr. White. He was very tall, and wore a light coat. Ah, a morning coat? No, he was in evening dress, and wore a light coat over it, and a soft hat. The very man, said the detective below his breath. Go on. He went into Mr. White's room, and shut the door. I don't know how long they were talking together, but I was sitting in this very room, and heard their voices get angry, and they were a-swearing at one another, which is the way with men, the brutes. I got up and went into the passage in order to ask him not to make such a noise, when Mr. White's door opens, and the gentleman in the light coat comes out, and bangs along to the door. Mr. White, he comes to the door of his room, and he hollers out, "'She is mine! You can't do anything!' And the other turns with his hand on the door and says, "'I can kill you, and if you marry her I'll do it, even in the open street.' "'Ah!' said Mr. Gorby, drawing a long breath. "'And then?' Then he bangs the door, too, which it's never shut easy since, and I ain't got no money to get it put right, and Mr. White walks back to his room, laughing. Did he make any remark to you? No, except he'd been worried by a lunatic. And what was the stranger's name? That I can't tell you, as Mr. White never told me. He was very tall, with a fair mustache, and dressed as I told you. Mr. Gorby was satisfied. That is the man, he said to himself, who got into the handsome cab and murdered White, there's no doubt of it. White and he were rivals for the heiress. "'What do you think of it?' said Mrs. Hableton curiously. "'I think,' said Mr. Gorby slowly, with his eyes fixed on her, "'I think that there is a woman at the bottom of this crime.'" End of chapter 5 Read by Sibella Denton For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.